Well, Quinn, Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato with the talented Mary Gamba, our executive producer and co-host. Mary, how are we doing today? I'm doing really great, Steve. How are you? I am terrific. Mary, uh, let's real quick let everyone know who our sponsors are. Yeah, would love to. Uh, Veolia, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, Seton Hall University, and the Bacino Leadership Institute. Go Pirates. Where's that mug, Steve? Come on. I know you got it. There you go. Good job. New Jersey Sharing Network, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Northward Center, Kessler Foundation, and last but not least, Delta Dental of New Jersey. Good stuff. Mary, let's introduce our very special guest. That Richard's been with us before. He's put out a new book, uh, and it's important to talk about. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm really excited. Richard Christopher Scuderi, author. The new book is The Enlightened Man, and his previous book is The Lonely Boy. He's also the president and founder of the Depression and Anxiety Support Group of Hunterdon. Richard, nice of you to join us once again today. It is such a pleasure to be here. I said it was such a long time. I was saying when we were setting up to Mary, she had short hair last time. That's how long it is. That yes. We've been together. <laughs> She's grown. But she looks terrific, Mary, by the way. She Thank sure you does. so much. She's growing it out. Hey, um, yep. Richard, real quick. The main message of the book, The Enlightened Man, and it's con Enlightened Man, and it's connection to leadership. Please. Mm -hmm. I really think um, and it's important when you are a leader. And if I could say, I do uh, a lot of, I'm in a lot of roles where I am a leader. I'm a leader in Maven Hill Designs, my business, which celebrates 25 years this year. But all the volunteering I do, I'm the president of the Somerset Hills Business Court Exchange for 17 years. I uh, have started, a, um, I have started a, an organization that volunteers for people that want to learn about uh, broadcasting called 52 and Blue Productions, where I do my television show on the Comcast channel called Design for the Times and my radio program with podcasts every Wednesday at three o'clock. And I bring a lot of people in and, I, and I'm in sort of a leadership role. Some of them are, are chosen, but with that, I think you have to grow as a person because you're a more effective leader when you grow, when you have life experiences. And Mary, um, you and I were talking about The Enlightened Man um, mm -hmm. during this week, getting ready for the show. And it's, it's an important book. It's also a book that is related to real life challenges that people face every day. But one of the messages in here is, quote, spiritual enlightenment as a tool to healing. Talk about that, Richard. You know, I always want to differentiate between spiritual and religion, because you can really turn people off with religion. And I don't mean to say that there's anything wrong with organized re religion, probably like you, because we're both Italians from Montclair State College. I was an altar boy and followed the Roman Catholic Church. And that right, there we go. And that was my path. But I found as I grew older personally, that I got more out of my own spirituality, my intuition, my wanting to help others. I want to bring it back to Montclair State College just for a minute, and it's actually in the book, but I thought maybe you could relate to this. Um, I took broadcasting courses. I wanted to work in television. It took me 30 years to do it, but you know, not to your level, but I am doing it now later in life. Uh, but I was in a class, and I had a professor. I don't know if you had him. His name was Dr. Tom Vienendahl. I don't know if you had him as a professor back in the day. He was, was terrific. terrific. And one day he was, he was teaching a class about empathy. And there were about 32 people in the class and we're talking about stuff. And he didn't, you know, cater to me or in any way particularly well. And one day when he was talking about empathy, he says, and Richard Scuderi is an empath. And wow, did that freak me out. Wow, did that freak me out. And it kind of made me feel like um, I was on a path with my life and people were recognizing uh, maybe a certain um, sympathy or or a nature that was uh, kind or wanted to do things with my life. And I go back to thinking that this is my purpose. The first book did way too well for a first time author that I was shelved next to Tony Robbins in the, Barnes the and Noble. The Lonely Boy? The Lonely Boy. The Lonely Boy, I'm sorry, the first book, which is still out by the way. Um, yeah. But what had happened, um, Steve, after the first book, fantastic, fantastic things, being on your show, having that honor of being on your show. I was on Fox 5, the 10 o'clock news on Saturday night. They came into the group that I had started, and we did a, a big piece on, on the news that, that millions, millions of people saw. It changed my life. I testified at the State House in uh, Trenton as one of the uh, victims for childhood, uh, uh, victims of childhood uh, sexual abuse. 
my life took off from this book. It, it really, I really believe it's my purpose. And I felt that I should continue the journey because where I last left you and now so much has happened and so much has evolved. And I want to inspire people. Let's get beyond COVID. Let's get rid of the fear mm. and let's move forward. Pick it up, Mary. Yeah. And Richard, there are so many people in the world that I know personally I come in touch with and I just feel like they're so angry. They're so hostile. Mm. They're so rigid and not flexible. Can you help them to be more kind? I know your book really dives into kindness. Is that kindness? Is kindness yeah. yeah. Is kindness something that can be taught? You know, I believe there's something in the brain called neuroplasticity. Now, I'm not a scientist, and I probably didn't pronounce that very well. But that means whether you are eight or 98, you can all change. And we kind of forget that. We rest on, well, I've always been this way. I'm always going to be this way now. <laughs> I don't believe that at all. Yeah, me neither. I had read a quote from a woman. I read a quote from a woman who was in her 80s, and an old Italian woman, and she said, I've survived because I'm like a tree. And I thought, what does that mean? She says that when, when the wind changes, I'm able to bend with the wind. And I thought, what an unbelievable thing to say. We can always change. And just as you feel, Mary, and I'm maybe sure Steve does too, I see people at their worst right now, very angry, very scared, very angry, and not in a good place. So what I've been trying to do um, on uh, my website, on some of the things that I do in my programs, I'm starting with little exercises that we can do to make people be nicer to each other. And the first one that I'm working on now is waving to people you don't know. So when you're in the car, when you're taking a walk, when you're doing stuff, just wave. It shows that we care. We're all on the same path, more or less. And some people gave me a one finger wave. <laughs> In New Jersey, yes, never. New Come Jersey. on, Richard. Okay, I'm Jersey. sorry, Britt, was, was that me? <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't. Anyway, so one of people, listen, I said I like your hair. You have to be nice to me now. You know, one, uh, one uh, uh, most people waved back. Some people stopped. And it was, uh, it was encouraging. You know, we forget because we get into our little regimented lives that we're all the same. God could pull us out at any second, right? So we sometimes take it a little bit too seriously. And I, I'm going to continue with that. I encourage people, wave, say hello. The worst they can do is make a scowl and walk away. Then they look stupid. Yeah. The next thing I want to do is something that happened to me. I, I'm hooked on Dunkin' Donuts decaf coffee. So I was stopping to get a cup of coffee. And the lady said to me, it's been paid for. And some stranger, this is just recently, some stranger just gave me a nod and like a hand wave and took care of that. What's better than that? That's awesome. You know, it's interesting, Richard, as we're listening to you talk about kindness and its connection, not just to leadership, but just being a better human being. I want to acknowledge our good uh, friend, Frank Mazzarella, Dr. Frank Mazzarella, who is one of the kindest, most extraordinary, empathetic people who said, you know, he told us about you and about your sure. work. And the thing about Frank that's so interesting is that Frank doesn't make it about himself. He makes it about Never. others. How am, talk about that leadership and it's about them. One of the chapters in my book, as I make it about me, my book, Lessons mm -hmm. in Leadership, um, it's about, <laughs> it's about. Says it's about them. Go ahead, real quick. Got about a minute left. Your book is better looking than my book, so I'm now a little bit jealous. But no, having said I have, that, I have an airbrush picture on the cover. So uh, that, it's I about need them. airbrush a lot of it. But having <laughs> uh, having said that, I want to say that this really, I always felt there was a little bit of divine intervention in this. And Dr. Frank uh, um, Mazzarella came into my life as a complete stranger. Now he's my doctor because I've been going through some things. But he came into my life because he said something in the book touched him in terms of wanting to go forward with kindness. You know, my mom lost her life to leukemia. His wife lost his life to leukemia and the similarities. So I met him quickly for a drink in, years ago in uh, Maplewood Village. And he said to you know what? I have connections and I know that you're doing this for the right reasons. And he has, it, it all became from him. And if I owe everything to him going forward with the, the uh, book being so successful to his kindness and paying it forward with no reference for anything to himself. There was nothing in it for him. It's just that he's that good of a person. And he's that good of a person, and um, he's part of the RWJ Barnabas Health families right. over at Caramas, and I've called him at every conceivable hour of the day and night, texted him, <laughs> Dr. Maz, I need you. And he is, he, and it's not about me, it's not about those texts, it's about always trying to be 
helpful to others, which sounds so right. corny. It is so true, and it's part of no, leadership. No, it's so true. Hey, Richard, do you mind if we plug again? Yes. I will say that, that there's a new cover to the book. I went with Amazon this time, and they made a little boo-boo on not getting the cover out in time for you guys to read it. But this is the cover. Same book. Same book. But that's a picture of me with my dad who just passed. In fact, if I could say my condolences, condolences, I think we both lost our dads at the same time. Time, Steve. Yeah. So I'm so sorry. For that. My condolences. But my, my dad was my dear friend, and I and I do miss him a lot. And I want to make sure that his face is on the cover of the book that people see. Yeah, a great and extraordinary tribute, Richard. I want to thank you so much. I want to wish you luck with the book, The Enlightened Man. Um, and uh, you can come back anytime. All the best, Richard. Thank you so much. You're so gracious, both of you. Thank you for everything. We agree. We are. No, I'm just talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Mary and I will be right back right after this on Lessons in Leadership. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, resourcing the world, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com. NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. Lessons in Leadership is pleased to introduce Michael Schmidt, who is Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. And also, also Michelle Adubato, back again by popular demand, the CEO, Northward Center, an organization our father founded in 1960. 71. Oh. Founded and also the founder of the Center for Autism, which Michelle founded. That's right. Good yeah. to see you, Michelle and Michael. Hi. Hey. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. You got this. Uh, this segment talks about, I mean, as leadership is always the theme throughout uh, lessons in leadership, but this is more specifically about leadership in the not-for-profit community, leadership in the foundation community, and foundations are not-for-profits. Let me ask you, Michelle, right out of the box. We've talked about this before, the difference between leadership in the corporate world or our world in the media or the not-for-profit world. Right now, the most significant challenge, in your view, pay, facing not-for-profit leaders is, finish the sentence. Viability, making sure that we're connecting to our community, making sure that we're providing services that are needed within the grassroots area of where we serve. It's extremely important to connect to where we are and who we are. Like as a North Ward Center, it, it says it's very, um, you know, talking about one ward, but it's so much more than that, but it's about a neighborhood. And that's where the North Ward Center came from, although we're citywide and statewide in many, in many ways. It's, we always have to keep that grassroots understanding. And Michelle's talking about the North Ward, the North Ward of Newark, one of five wards in the great city of North Brick City. Uh, and North Ward Center's website will be up. You'll find out all about their services and the impact they're making in the community, an organization founded by our dad over 50 years ago, our late dad. Um, Michael, first time you're joining us on Lessons in Leadership, you see not-for-profits. Uh, we happen to be the Caucus Educational Corporation, our not-for-profit PBS-affiliated production company is supported by the Healthcare Foundation. They also support the North Ward Center as well. Michael, let me ask you, you see not-for-profit leaders all the time because we're begging you for money and hopefully <laughs> making a, a decent case for it. Michael, your view of the most significant challenge or challenges facing not-for-profit leaders, please. Well, first of all, Steve, thank you. Thank you for having me on. And it's a pleasure to be able to support the caucus education for their excellent work, as well as the North Ward. And we feel privileged and honored to be partners with you. Um, as Michelle said, I think viability is important, but I think today at this very moment, the most critical issue that is facing nonprofits is staffing. 
this we're seeing across the sector, not just in the nonprofit sector, but particularly in the nonprofit sector, given the challenges that we have in identifying appropriate staff, funding those positions, and being able to serve the communities in which we operate. Wow, uh, Michael, you've opened up a massive <laughs> can of leadership worms right now. Uh, the Caucus Educational Corporation, our not-for-profit uh, sister organization, we've lost some talented people in the last year or so. I know Michelle's organization, the Northwood Center, has lost some talented people. We're sitting there going, where are they going? We're the best. How could they ever want to be with anyone else? But Michelle, you've had to face that. A, how hard has it been? And B, what has it taught you as a leader about the retention of talented people? And then Mary will jump in after that. Go ahead, Michelle. I mean, it's like nothing that we have ever seen. We've never seen anything like this with staffing. Um, Michael, you hit it. Uh, it has been, what it's taught us is nothing's guaranteed. That old way of thinking about someone's going to be with you for a long time is over. And it's oh, almost wait, like, you, oh, are you right, saying, it is, oh, it is. Mary, you're saying Mary Gamba, 22 <laughs> years together. That's not a guarantee that we're going to finish this, go off into the sunset together. You, like you know, it's not a guarantee because I already gave you my window. <laughs> right, right. Every, you know point. what, Mary? Everyone has a window. That's a good way to put it. And it I'm is. learning that. But but some people are not honest about their window, Michelle. And, and Michael, True. I would love to get your thoughts on this as well. What? How do you encourage your team that whole two weeks? Oh, I'm giving my two weeks notice. That doesn't work today. How do you let your team know? You want to know what? It's okay if you need to change. It's okay if you need to go and explore something else professionally. But Michael, how specifically can you let your team know that it is okay to share that window without any repercussions from you know the CEO of an organization? Well, you know, Mary, that's a great question. I think the world has changed in terms of the relationship between the employer and employee. And I have always tried to be very transparent with my employees. And I think one thing that the pandemic has taught us is the need to look at the whole employee, not just the side that we see between nine and five or nine to six or whatever that may be. And what I have done over the course of my career has always encouraged employees to be honest about what they need for their own personal and professional growth, and also to have my tentacles out there. And I've always said to my staff, you should, I should not be surprised by anything that you share with me. So if I have an employee who's looking for a change or an employee who for whatever reason needs to move on to a different opportunity, first I'll try to see if I can address that opportunity within the organization and right. try to find either a lateral or a another kind of move that that person can make. Um, in larger organizations, that's been possible. And in certain organizations, it's just not possible. Sometimes people outgrow a, a particular position. They've done their best. They've given what they can, and it's time for them to move on. And I think making a plan together, like you say, two weeks is not nearly enough, particularly in this economy, to be able no. to replace anybody. So having a plan and being able to think of what an exit strategy might look like, both for the person and for the employer, I think puts both sides at ease. And I think having the employee hear from the boss that sometimes it's okay to move on and we won't be angry and we won't be upset. We'll of course be disappointed. And of course it will be a headache to find a new person, particularly when it's a great person. I had a, in my last job, a wonderful employee. He was with me for a number of years and ultimately he was starting a family and he decided for a variety of reasons that he wanted to move out of this city where we were working together to another city. And we had an open conversation about that and we talked about what that meant and we worked on each other's timetables. He gave me a little bit additional time. I was more prepared to find a replacement. And ultimately that allowed for a smooth transition for him out of the organization and someone new to come in. M Michelle, we're gonna go there, you ready? Very specific to not. Michelle, Michelle, can you hear me? I'm, I'm going I'm to uh, throw a curveball at you. Ready? Mary, with all my props, I'm going to throw oh. a curveball. <laughs> Michelle, you ready? Is it going to be a strike? It's within the family. It's okay. Yeah, exactly. You. you ready? Yes. Michelle and I grew up with a role model, <laughs> otherwise known as a father, for whom I'm going to be gentle here, Michael. Uh, and Mary. Be nice. Our late dad. I know my mother listens, our mother listens every weekend to lessons in leadership. Our father saw someone leaving as a personal, you're laughing because it's true, a personal affront, 
a lack of loyalty. And I would be lying, Michelle, to say that there have been times that I haven't felt exactly the same way. Now, I just listened to what Michael said, which makes way too much sense. Yeah, I, and, yeah. Okay, but Michelle. Inclu by the way, including his children, he <laughs> felt that way. If we moved out of Newark, we were chicken, you know what. Don't so, even go there. Like, so he was yeah, an equal. So, so how do you deal with that? We, we, you know, I, I agree with you. Michael is much more mature than I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm going with Michael. Go ahead. It has hurt. You know, you're losing people that you thought you'd never lose. And they're, and here's another thing that I think nonprofits are facing. We're in person, like we, our business's service is in person and we can't compete with the online, you know, virtual, you know, I had a wonderful employee leave me because he, he was offered a job that he never had to show up. You know, he showed up on a computer. I couldn't, I couldn't compete with that because our, our job is to be with people. Um, that that's who we are. That's what, that's what nonprofits are. So I have to tell you, I'm still working on, I've learned, I've gotten better, but it does hurt. And I do think that's at sometimes that the employee has almost sometimes taken advantage of this environment that we're in right now, because we know people that they'll say they they'll take the job. They just won't show up. And it happens over and over and over again until one day you have to say, is it us? Is it them? Or is it all of the environment that's going on? It's almost like there's too many choices. You know, Michelle, yeah. it, it does hurt. And it's absolutely painful when you have an excellent employee who leaves. You know, you have to train somebody, you have to hire somebody, yeah. you have to bring them in, they have to acculturate to the organization. Um, but from my experience, even though it does hurt and even though I'm pained and I feel that sudden uh in my stomach, yeah, exactly. someone uh, shares, uh. With me, shares with me the news, um, I have found that working with the person to try to make it as smooth as possible sometimes can actually lead to them coming back. So there are some employees who, you know, who need to leave because they need to experience something else. This was their first job out of college and they got great experience and now they need to be under somebody else's wing and experience. But I've had several employees who've actually come back and worked with me after a hiatus of a number of years. And that always is, is wonderful and feels very sweet. Michael, I yeah, think Michelle. you hit it when you said transparency. I think that's what we need. We just need to be transparent with each other. And I think that's something that we're learning. Let's be honest. And what Mary said, let's be real. What are you looking for? And if I can't provide it, let's talk about it. And let's leave in all good terms. But let me play a little, little devil's advocate. First of all, I'm going to grow up, and if I can one day grow up when I get even older to be like Michael, uh, yes. meaning very much. <laughs> very reasonable, mature about these things. Mary, let's be honest. Even the amount of hair you have on your head, just. No, but Michael, <laughs> I gotta tell you something. I gotta tell you something. Mary and I have had so many conversations and PS, 10, about 10, I don't know how many years ago, Mary came to me and she said, I'm leaving. We, we talked about this on lesson, leadership, I'm leaving. And there was more money involved. <laughs> there was a whole bunch of perks they're not even perks. No, flexibility. Yeah. Flexibility. She earned it all. But that being said, her honesty with me was also about, and we've talked about this before, I don't want to work in the environment in which you are leading in certain ways and acting in certain ways and communicating in certain ways because it's not good for me. It hurt. I wanted to argue with her, except it's her perspective. And the point was she gave me a chance to evolve. She gave me a chance to change. But look, think about, Mary, how much honesty and courage it yeah. took and trust for you to do that with me. We had some people leave who we gave bonuses to. We gave flexibility to everything they said they wanted. Two weeks later, I'm out of here. And mm -hmm. so what are they supposed to That takes a lot of trust, no, Mary? Yeah, no, it definitely takes a lot of trust. And I hear what Michael and Michelle are both saying, that we are all working and evolving toward this new normal, the pandemic, in addition to working remotely and people needing more flexibility, it did create a lot of new workplace scenarios that we're all adapting to and getting used to. So I think it is all of us as leaders, we do need to pivot and adapt and not just expect someone else to change, to go back to the way that we used to work. But now we need to also get creative and innovative as well. Shift gears for a second, got three minutes left. Relationship building, one of the, relationship building and leadership. 
Michael, it struck me that Michelle had established some relationship with you pretty quickly. I don't even know what the dynamics were. Um, but there have been previous CEOs of the Healthcare Foundation that we've developed relationships with. We're developing it with you as we speak right now. Michelle, real quick, how much harder is it creating, establishing relationships in this environment versus five years ago? Well, let, let me just say that, you know, the Healthcare Foundation decades long relationship has been so supportive of the North Ward Center. And Michael continues that leg legacy. That's and right. Michael, thank you for that. Um, he understood right from the bat how important the North Ward Center was to our community. And we appreciate his support because without foundations, nonprofit foundations, you know, need nonprofits and nonprofits need foundations to continue that connection into the community. So, you know, what has changed is that we have to be technologically proficient, which many of our nonprofits aren't sometimes. We have to go and roll with those punches, much more flexibility. Um, and we do have to, I think what I've learned as a leader is that we have to listen more to our employees, really have what, what mm. I call authentic conversations. Ms. Michael, Michelle, you're absolutely correct. Go I ahead, mean, Michael. listening has been critical and thank you for your kind words, but you know, we serve at the pleasure of the community and our role really is to put in place whatever structures we can to help support and bolster the community. And by doing so we need to start by listening. And actually, uh, the Northward was one of the first places that I actually got to visit. And it was a wonderful place to visit because as you know, Michelle does everything top, top notch. And the program that I attended, the ribbon cutting for the opening of the sports center was really just a, a fabulous event and a wonderful introduction into the community. But the pandemic really has demonstrated how important these relationships are. Your strongest relationship is only as good as the crisis that it can help take you through. And you wanna develop those relationships before there's a crisis. So before I need to pick up the phone and say to Michelle, I need your assistance with feeding people or I need your assistance with offering a day center to older adults or whatever the program may be, I need to have a relationship with her. And so one of the challenges that the pandemic has created is the ability to relate to people one-on-one -on -one and to have those informal conversations that we've all had and enjoyed yeah. at the end of a meeting or, or going to um, an event. Being able to meet with people on Zoom has helped to minimize some of that. It hasn't replaced it completely. And creating new relationships is really important. I spent, I'm at this position a little over a year. I spent my entire first year on a listening tour, really just meeting people. Um, my executive assistant said, your calendar can't squeeze in any more people, Michael. And I literally from morning till night have just been listening and hearing what, what's out there in the community, what the community is facing and hearing about how we as the Healthcare Foundation can support them. Uh, I wish we had more time. We will have both of you back talking more about leadership in the foundation slash not-for-profit community. Uh, insightful, important, valuable, and uh, listening. Michael, in our family, listening was a learned skill set that was not natural to us. Let me just say that. Michelle's laughing. She knows what I mean. Listening and leadership and a whole range of other topics. Um, Michael Schmidt, Michelle Adubato. Uh, great leaders, Mary Gamba. On behalf of everyone here, Lessons at Leadership, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, Veolia, resourcing the world, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com. NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine.